Hong Kong lies half on, half off the mainland of China. To the south, Hong Kong Island. To the north, Kowloon, meaning nine dragons, after the hills behind it. The territories there and the island have been a British colony since 1842, leased as a trading post for opium merchants, the drug barons of their day. In between the two centres, an arm of the China Sea forms a splendid sheltered harbour that originally attracted those 19th century empire builders. Today, the only arriving imperialists Hong Kong attracts are the corporate moguls with designs on new and untapped markets. This is Asia's Manhattan, teeming, noisy, vigorous, greedy, fortified by towers of wealth and pleasure. Europeans and Chinese still divide the spoils of Hong Kong, just as they always have. Hong Kong's boom of the late 1980s attracted investors from further afield, from America and Australia. Today, Hong Kong has almost as many millionaires as it has high rises. But for how much longer is the question? Right now, 1997 is viewed by most with trepidation. Many are resigned to having to leave when the cash register rings for the last time. Others plan to stay on, hoping that the mainland Chinese will want to keep Hong Kong as a commercial showcase and put their capitalist expertise to use. Many, born in China, will have no choice but to stay. And others will continue to enjoy the good life for as long as they can. There are still fortunes to be made and lost and announced. But with six million residents crammed into just 1,000 square kilometers, the problem for most is simply how to get about. On weekday mornings, it seems that the majority want to change trains at Mong Kok, one of the busiest stations served by Hong Kong's subway, the mass transit railway. Here, commuters can transfer from one line to another without even leaving the platform. Each station is individually color-coded to ensure even the most bleary-eyed make the right connection. Every day, a million and three-quarter passengers, workers, shoppers, tourists, pile aboard the gleaming cars. On holidays, the travelling load has been known to rise to as much as two and a quarter million. As above ground, the crush here can be severe, with scant regard for the universal rule of let the passengers off first. But for those not strong enough to face the morning game of sardines, they can rest assured that in less than two minutes, there'll be another train to get them to work on time. Hong Kong has the only subway system that's more popular in the summer months than winter. Air conditioning in both stations and trains offers a welcome relief from the heat and humidity of the streets. The British-made carriages offer little else in terms of creature comforts to soothe the cramped commuter. But for most, with an average commuting time of just 25 minutes, the suffering seems bearable secure in the knowledge that the mass transit railway has an unblemished safety record and a history free of industrial action. Like many companies in Hong Kong, the MTR's three and a half thousand staff are managed by a minority of European department heads who pioneered the system. Wilfred Newton, up until recently their chairman, explained some of the problems unique to Hong Kong that they encountered. Well, Hong Kong's terrain is very rugged, and that forces all development, residential, commercial, industrial, and transport into fairly well-defined and narrow corridors. It means that space for roads is, is limited, and the cost of building each incremental kilometre of road is higher than the last kilometre. The roads become heavily congested with traffic, and in the last three years, when Hong Kong has really boomed, um, commercial traffic has increased very sharply, so that um, it's a natural environment in which to have underground, off-road modes of transport such as an underground railway. Without the underground iron, as the local Chinese refer to the subway, streets like this would have become impassable. But the trains cannot go everywhere, and despite MTR's efficiency, trams and double-decker buses are more than just reminders of a bygone era. They're still vital to the city's infrastructure, connecting residents and workplace, suburb and centre.
Perhaps the greatest difference MTR made was providing a dependable subway link between the island and the mainland center, Kowloon. By the time it was opened in 1980, the two-lane road tunnel beneath the harbor had become a permanent submarine traffic jam. Even now, the pressure on it is overwhelming, despite campaigns persuading people to leave their cars at home. For many, home is Kowloon, with its massive public housing developments. Hong Kong Island, the city's financial center, is the destination for most Pekau commuters. Between the two lies Victoria Harbor. The three lines of the mass transit railway have proved a vital service not only for the colony's mobile workforce, but also the government, for whom territories previously out of reach were opened up for housing and development. Most importantly, it provided an alternative means of crossing the harbor. Hong Kong means fragrant water. Not even the city's fondest admirers would think that appropriate now. A new container terminal has helped make it one of the world's busiest ports in terms of cargo volume. The shadows of the old tea and opium clippers have long been chased away, and even the junks now spout diesel fumes, their graceful sails little but a memory, their anchorages filled with yachts called cash flow and gold standard. It's only the annual typhoon season that intrudes to slow the daily passage of marine traffic through the busiest harbor channel in the world. But there is a constant reminder of yesterday's more easygoing city in the green, double-ended little craft that butt their way across the harbor in all weathers. The hardy star ferries. Meridian star, eastern star, rising star. The practice of giving them heavenly names goes back to the company that got the Cross Harbor concession well before the turn of the century. Once the star ferries were the only way to get from the island to Kowloon, but virtually overnight they lost nearly a quarter of their business to a competitor for whom Hong Kong's weather was of less importance. It was, however, the fear of floods that determined the unique design of the MTR's carriages, the so-called dragon trains. Open at both ends, passengers can evacuate from a stranded train by ramps lowered at either end, protected by massive floodgates that seal the tunnel itself. Most of the other design factors were determined by the requirements of maximizing space. Over 300 people can fit into each of these cars, fewer than 50 can sit. This is a true underground railway. Of its 24 miles of track, only five run on the surface. The island line is the most recently built extension. Here, the problems of engineering so close to the foundations of some of Hong Kong's largest structures were acute. Cut and cover methods of tunneling were impossible and digging had to be completed underground. But like the other two lines, it was finished within budget and some seven weeks ahead of schedule. The two transfer stations, Admiralty and Central, are now the most popular destinations for office-bound commuters who are transported from noisy street via muted walkway into the heart of the city. This is Hong Kong's Gold Coast, the world's third largest financial market that came of age in the boom of the early 1980s. Then, a bold vision of the future and the confident declaration of a gilded city-state. Central District has attracted investors from around the world, anxious to stake a claim in Asia's expanding markets. One of the biggest investors has been Hong Kong's communist neighbors. The new Bank of China was designed as the world's tallest skyscraper to assure the colony that there would be little change after 1997 when they take over. But the city's brokers might need more convincing evidence. For many, property formed the foundation of their burgeoning empires one of the largest developers is a company whose primary business is transportation, the Mass Transit Railway Corporation. Well, our shares are owned by the government, but we operate very much as though we were a private sector company. And we are required, in terms of our ordinance, to operate in accordance with prudent commercial principles. And we are required to ensure that without subsidy of any kind, uh, our revenues exceed our expenditures. That means we're the controls upon us are competition, 
the balance sheet, the profit and loss account, and the cash flow statement. This approach, unique when compared to their international counterparts in public transport, has earned the MTR a blue chip rating on the stock exchange. Besides the central district, the company has successfully invested in suburban developments like Cornhill Plaza, their biggest to date, with 100,000 square feet of commercial and office space, all of it housed directly above the stations and depots of the subway. In this vast pulsating pleasure dome, weekend crowds gather to spend as fast as they earn, while below the dragon train waits to whisk them home. When you build a railway in a densely developed urban environment, you create airspace above the stations, you create airspace above the, the railway depots and yards, and um, it makes sense to use that airspace. So that when we build the underground structure, we create the foundations for a development above it that will take maximum advantage of the plot ratio for the site. Heng Fa Chun, which means Almond Blossom Village, has 6,600 6, flats in high-rise buildings. Uh, it doesn't look much like an Almond Blossom Village, but that's being very successful indeed. Property development was originally conceived by the subway's principals as a means of recouping their construction costs, facilitated by a government only too flexible when it came to turning a public service into a profitable source of revenue. Like much of Hong Kong, land around the subway lines had to be reclaimed from the harbour. The majority of these apartments had been sold even before construction was complete. A seemingly endless supply of cheap labour and low expectations of living space keeps costs low and profits high. For a development like Hing Fa Chuen, the corporation enters into a partnership with one of the city's large development companies. Airspace is then leased to the developer, who raises all the risk capital in return for 50% of the profits. It's an arrangement that suits both sides. MTR has invested in 17 other sites like this and now manages some 25,000 living units, ensuring their familiar logo is associated with some of the most modern housing available. Traffic-free Almond Blossom Village is for many an ideal few thought they could achieve, let alone afford. By the early 1970s, 50% of Hong Kong's population was resident in public housing projects. A drastic reversal of the days when the colony had more squatters than homeowners, frantically clustered around the waterfront and swelled by thousands of Vietnamese boat people. These are not the only changes in recent times witnessed by long-term observers like Michel Han. I think it was Y.K. Power who once said defending the, the the squatter areas if you don't have the squatter areas if you don't have the public housing you won't have that drive for people to get out of there and to reach the peak if you want so he he felt that's what made hong kong tick was this tremendous ambition because there is quite a difference between the low-income people and the wealthy here it's a very marked contrast and i think hong kong being so small it's very visible to everybody you're all piled in together Population density in the city is still the highest in the world. But for many, government-subsidized housing is the first rung on the social ladder upwards, and living space a relative concept. For Terence Chow and his family, it presents few problems. I live with my parents and uh, two younger sisters in this uh, public housing flat in uh, Kowloon. Um, this is one of the very typical flats in Hong Kong, which is about, say, 300 square feet in all. 
with uh, one room and then one kitchen and your own toilets, which we feel very, very happy when we initially moved in. Because before we moved in, we lived in one room in an apartment block. I must also say that I'm used to working and used to living in this city where everything is um, congested and constrained. You've got pressure on everything. You live in a small space where, where you, it is easy for you to quarrel with your parents or your sisters or with your neighbors. There's, this happened very often when I was young. But after I, I learned how to live with it and um, I make a living with all these pressures, I find that it's enjoyable now. For the coming, say, five to ten years, um, I would think that I have got to work harder and harder um, to improve my living condition and try to become a professional and then try to get settled down with a better living environment, better standard of living, and then at least uh, a sort of good steady income that my parents can, um, can rely on after they retire. <laughs> Few would deny that Hong Kong's greatest asset is its people. Their productivity is prodigious, matched by a firm grasp of free market principles, and many still support extended families on the mainland. Here, markets never close and shifts never end for the city's shopkeepers, especially when there's a willing tourist at hand. You need a box? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the wheel one costs very expensive. That was sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one more. Okay, get it. Which one? Get that one? Yeah, I charge. Black one. Stanley Market is still the favorite spending destination for most visiting guailos or tourists. There are not as many bargains here as there once were. Many of these items, made in Hong Kong, are exported at comparable back home prices. Nonetheless, the range is impressive and prices negotiable. As well as the usual electronic toys, there are the usual designer labels, not all of them genuine. The government tries to control the manufacture of forgeries, it cannot control the instinctive human urge for a haggle or a bargain. Despite the many influences that have deluged Hong Kong, the official style remains British to the end. There's no real military presence here, an occasional warship in the harbour, or a band at the church bazaar. Hong Kong could not be defended for a day if the Chinese decided not to wait until 1997. Since the students revolt, none can ignore that possibility. But still, Hong Kong Chinese look to a British government to represent their political interests and protect their economic stability. Even while the colonial banners are still at the mastheads, the People's Republic have let it be known that they will be moving into the old courthouse, now dwarfed, like government house and other symbolic edifices, by the Bank of China. How much further they will go, few can anticipate with certainty. In the days of rickshaws and steamer trunks and long drinks at sunset, Hong Kong meant the Peninsula Hotel. Noel Coward, Somerset Maugham and other period celebrities of the Far East were regular patrons. For those who long for those earlier days, it's still an irresistible rendezvous for tea among the potted palms. But the elegant ambience of those colonial retreats is being replaced by oriental charm and wealth. Japanese tourists on a shopping raid 
or local entrepreneurs on expense accounts closing a deal for their fabrics or shipping firms. Now East is East and West is on the way out. I think the, the British have always been much more uh, administrators. So their life, their, their public lifestyles are obviously quite different. I think a lot of people have the misconception when they come to Hong Kong that the colonials have all the wealth. That's actually not, not correct. It, it really is the, uh, the Chinese here. And of course, to a certain degree, the, um, the independent foreigners, not, not the English um, government, but the independent foreigners who come and made money here. The wealth here is, is, is extraordinary. I don't think people realize how wealthy people are here. The guests arriving at this grand charity auction did not get here by dragon train. The occasion is being hosted by jewellery designer Philippe Chariol. As a Frenchman, he knows that his country provides an important element in the evening's enjoyment. More French cognac is drunk per capita in Hong Kong than anywhere else. But as an independent foreigner, the great appeal of the city is paying personal income tax at a flat 16%. Uh, real wealth is into Chinese, you know, there is immense wealth here, cash wealth, you know, and the people want uh, to buy things or want to acquire. It's just like water here. It's, uh, it's must be one of the, it must be the most affluent city in the world today. It, it is very glamorous, but it is very open. Nobody is hiding its wealth, you know. Uh, whenever you make money here, you can show it and there is no problem. You don't have any Uncle Sam behind or uh, tax people going after you. So everybody is openly showing whatever he wants to show. You know? Table 12, 12,000 dollars from table 12. Table 29, is that 13? We have 14,000 dollars from table 1. Table 1. 14,000 ladies and gentlemen. Do we have 15,000? 14,000 dollars ladies and gentlemen. Going once, going twice. And it's sold to table 18. For the evening rush hour commuters, they too will have a chance to do some late night shopping, even before they leave the station. In its imperative drive for profit, the mass transit railway has neglected few opportunities. Not only the train interiors, but the platforms, the concourses, even the tickets themselves carry advertising. The posters that plaster the station walls are very much what is to be found in any system around the world, except that here they're in a variety of languages, European and Oriental, and everywhere. But the concessions which turn the concourses into shopping arcades are almost as varied as the markets in the streets above. There are underground cake shops, boutiques, travel agents, dry cleaners, tobacconists and florists. And of course, the essential accessories stocked in such profusion in shops on the surface this will shortly be the first subway system on which portable phones can be used. To date we've realized about three billion Hong Kong dollars in, in property profits and ultimately we expect to realize about four billion dollars which is a very useful contribution to the cost of constructing the railway. Our advertising and other, uh, and other sources of revenue bring in in, in total a little over 10% of the fair revenue. In other words, the fair revenue at 100%, the others uh, may bring it up to about 110, 112%. So it's very useful. While the extra revenue does not yet subsidize fares, this is still a cheap system on which to travel. The maximum fare is just six Hong Kong dollars, about 75 US cents. Not surprisingly, Hong Kong's mass transit railway is being looked at with great interest by other cities. Few have matched their ability to reap profit from public service.
Stay with us next for our weekly series, Crime Traveler. This week's episode is entitled, Death Minister. <laughs> 